the big hand. Thank you uh, for the introduction. Uh, many of you or some of you have met me in conjunction with autonomous ships, but today uh, the theme is more uh, digitalization in general. The first question is uh, perhaps already answered in the first session today. Um, we are looking at big challenges in terms of decarbonization of shipping. Uh, one of them is uh, zero carbon fuels. Uh, we are looking at prices of fuel, which can be from three to six times higher than heavy fuel. Uh, the volumes are bigger, they are dangerous, they are corrosive, so on and so forth. And you can argue that this will require new types of shipping systems, new types of ships, and possibly new business models, and certainly a digital transformation. Uh, one example we have from Norway, uh, this uh, was at least uh, last year, the world's biggest plant for production of liquid biogas, with a capacity of about 25 tons a day. It's a fairly big plant, and it uh, uses raw materials from the paper industry and from the aquaculture. However, if you look at uh, the energy demands for one of these uh, large uh, uh, container ships, they will need about 150 tons LNG per day. So you need six of those plants for one ship. So I, I think it's quite obvious that we, we have to look also for more energy efficient systems, uh, better systems, newer types of transport systems, uh, in addition to all the work that needs to be done on alternative fuels and alternative machinery. Also, uh, we had the Ever Given incident uh, some years ago uh, with a, a huge uh, uh, a queue of ships uh, in, in, uh, in the Red Sea. As a result, there are big disruptions in international trade. And we also have gone through the COVID um, epidemic with uh, uh, stops in uh, LA, uh, delays also in many types of shipping, crew that cannot come off the ships, so on and so forth. Digitalization will not solve this problem, but it's important component in partly avoiding them and also to uh, fix the problem when it occurs. And how do we do this? Um, a lot of people are talking about digital transformation. Uh, I'm not sure if we can, for instance, use the principles they use in the mobile telephone industry. But uh, we'll come back to that. Uh, if you look at digitalization or the digital transformation, you could look at it as a kind of three-step uh, procedure. At the bottom, you have to do a digital transformation. You have to convert all your paper to a digital uh, format. This will not save you money, it will cost you money. It will save some paper, it will save some storage, but basically this is a costly uh, process. Again, standards will help you to do this uh, cheaply because it can show you how to do this and uh, you get some uh, previous experience. Uh, the next step, when you have digitalized, uh, sorry, when you have made uh, your stuff uh, digital, then you can do digitalization, which is basically automating the processes, uh, mostly in-house, but also between companies. To do it between companies, you need standards. To do it in-house, standards will help you to save money. But the interesting thing with standards is that they enable the digital transformation. If you have a standardized uh, way of transferring information between parties, you have standardized information models, stuff like that, it becomes much easier to make new types of applications to save fuel, to uh, avoid disruptions, and so on. And this is here the money can be earned. And also here the new business models will be created. So standards create an eco ecosystem, in a sense, uh, which enables the digital uh, transformation. And my uh, point of view is that we cannot have a digital transformation of the shipping industry without standards. 
As I mentioned, uh, if you look at the mobile telephone industry, it's a fantastic rate of innovation there. But the basic for that is that we have around 7.5 billion smartphones, even more, in the world today. Not all of them are used, but all of these uh, phones are on two platforms, most of them anyway. Uh, so if you make a, a new smart application, you have a big market to, to sell it to. This is not the case in shipping. Uh, depending on how you count, we have uh, between 50 and 120,000 ships in international trade. Uh, if you count those bigger than 100 gross tons, it's uh, 96,000 one year ago at least. And all of these ships are different. You have to do a lot of commissioning to take one software, uh, say an energy optimization system, from one ship to another. Even if they are sister ships, they are typically built with uh, one or two years uh, uh, in between. And that creates differences in the IT system. And again, we have to avoid this and try to get standards uh, in place that kind of builds over this uh, uh, yeah, variance in platforms. The second point uh, which we are trying to uh, also emphasize is that shipping is international. The ships, they move between ports all over the world. And we need standards that are international. It won't help a ship if the if a digital communication with a port in, say, Busan is very different from the same type of uh, communication in uh, Singapore or Rotterdam. We have to have the same protocols. And one of the problems we have today is a number of different initiatives covering uh, uh, more or less the same uh, application area. Here are some examples from uh, a very relevant example, the maritime single window. Uh, the new FAL convention requires uh, that every, every uh, signatory implements an electronic maritime single window January 1st, 2024. And here we have some uh, different standards uh, to select between, and there are more. Uh, this is not necessarily a problem, and it may even be necessary if you look at the local regional uh, system then you can allow to have the regional local standards. But again, for ships moving between ports all over the world, we really need to have standards for the things like that. And uh, according to Lloyd's, it's about 8,000 international ports in the world. So you can imagine what kind of problem we have if everybody has their own standard or specification. So again, international cooperation is uh, needed and we need to do it through robust and recognized standard organizations. And it's here that IMO actually has uh, uh, taken some action to solve this problem. Uh, the facilitation committee, which is not uh, so often heard about, they have established an expert group on data harmonization, uh, which have developed what they call the IMO compendium, which is a reference model for uh, exchange of information between ships and shore, mainly focusing on the maritime single window so far, but also increasing into other domains. How does uh, this work? Um, it started as a cooperation between IMO, UNEC, which is responsible for the EDIFACT standards, uh, World Customs Organization, and ISO. And you could roughly say that World Customs Organization is uh, uh, responsible for the governmental data exchanges, UNEC is mostly into trade, while ISO is uh, working on operational data exchanges in the shipping domain. And, and the overlap uh, between uh, these uh, standards in, uh, in the area of matter and single window was kind of uh, determined through the analysis of the FAL Convention. And we agreed on developing a common reference model that could be mapped to each of these standards. And that means that you can select between EDIFACT or ISO XML standards when you implement your uh, maritime single window, but there is semantic interoperability between information elements. And this is basically the IMO compendium. Uh, this has been updated uh, as the years uh, have uh, passed, and uh, we are now into a cooperation between several uh, relatively big organizations, uh, BIMCO among them, International uh, Association of Ports and Harbor, IHO, GS1, DCSA, and so on and so forth. Uh, trying to extend 
the data model also into other types of uh, communication between port and ship. And we are currently working on just-in-time arrival for the ships. And this means that you can implement just-in-time arrival with standardized protocols in every port that implements the international standard. And, and the point here is that the IMO compendium is not the standard in itself, it's a reference. So if you implement this in IHO models, for instance, in uh, terms of uh, uh, bollard IDs and uh, overlays on the ECTIS, these data elements will be compatible with the uh, voyage orders to the captain, including birth positions and stuff like that. So it's a reference model that can be mapped to individual uh, standards for different uh, domains. So, so this is a very interesting development that has increased interest in standardization tremendously in the shipping sector. And I would really encourage you to have a very close look at this work, particularly if you work with digital standardization and try to get into this uh, working group so that also new standards, new uh, protocols are uh, at least enabled to be uh, compatible with uh, existing uh, standards. Another point which is very important is uh, digital trust. Uh, when you digitalize uh, working processes, for instance, just in time arrival, in principle it means that you remove the human from the loop. And that also means that you remove the human sanity check from the loop. And the computers will be very reliant on authentication and integrity checks of the data. You need to have digital signatures on these uh, information exchanges. This applies to stuff like autonomous systems, which will be totally without crew, but also for traditional shipping that are becoming more and more dependent on digital information exchanges. And this has to be internationally accepted. Um, IMO has uh, already provided a guideline for this based on a uh, private public uh, key system, which uh, uh, defines how this could be done. And we are considering whether we should set up an international, uh, what you call a public key infrastructure, for instance, through IMO, to provide a kind of international uh, accepted digital certificates for this type of, uh, of information exchange. And that could even be uh, handled in the fall convention to, uh, to make it uh, easy to incorporate the national law that this type of signature could be accepted. Uh, myself, I'm active in ISO and we are working on uh, the ISO version of the maritime single window standards, the 2025 electronic port clearance, uh, where we are currently developing part one, payload agnostic transmission protocol. And we are also uh, developing uh, part three now for just in time arrival and various other types of, um, of uh, information exchanges in the maritime sector. So to sum up, a digital transformation is needed. I think that was also underlined in the first session today that we really need digitalization in addition to all this hardware and the new types of fuels to sustain sustainable development goals, uh, particularly for decarbonization, but also for increased resilience and other uh, parts of the sustainable development goals. And my statement is that a digital transformation will require international standards. I don't think the shipping sector is uh, big enough. 100,000 ships is nothing compared to uh, 6 billion uh, mobile phones. We really need to cooperate and we really need to work through international standards to get this uh, digital uh, transformation wor uh, working. And obviously, international standards will also require international cooperation and coordination. We, we, it's a very small sector, the shipping sector, and we cannot afford that everybody is uh, developing their own specification and standards. We really need to coordinate and, co and uh, cooperate on this. Uh, when I go to conferences, it's the same faces I see each time. It's a very small sector. Uh, digital signatures is also something we will uh, need. So that has to be considered and again, internationally uh, agreed on and standardized. And I also encourage you to have a look at uh, the development of the ISO 28005 series uh, to see if that's something you can use. So that was uh, what I was planning to say. Thank you for your attention.